up next, we're going to be speaking with longtime members of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP for short, about the legacy of Larry Kramer, a key figure in the history of, direct act, of the Direct Action Group. Bob Letterer was, and I, John Riley, still am, currently a member of ACT UP. Larry Kramer died of pneumonia last Wednesday at age 84. The group was founded in 1987. That same year, 13,329 people died of AIDS in the United States, and there was only one government-approved drug treatment, AZT, and that wasn't very good. Every succeeding year, the death toll mounted until 1995, when it peaked at 41,000, and that's just in the U.S. But the next year, in 1996, with the release of a then new class of antiviral drugs called protease inhibitors, the death toll in wealthy countries at least, where people with AIDS had access to these enormously expensive brand name products, went down significantly, a decrease which continued for years after that. Um, we were going to begin with a segment uh, from Jean Carlomusto's film, Larry Kramer in Love and Anger. Um, which uh, was to set the scene uh, about the for that led to the formation of ACT UP New York. And uh, it's a tremendous documentary. I'm sorry that we can't provide it of uh, the sound clip from for tonight, but uh, there was a technical problem that we just discovered. So, um, however, uh, we do have the filmmaker with us, uh, Jean Carla Musto is uh, uh, had her film first broadcast on HBO in 2015. It was featured at the Sundance Film Festival. She was nominated for two Emmy Awards. And uh, she, she also has directed and produced Sex in an Epidemic, which premiered on Showtime. Jean was an early pioneer in the AIDS activist movement in 1986. She started the media unit at Gay Men's Health Crisis. As a member of ACT UP, she was a founder of Diva TV, that stood for uh, Damned Interfering Video Activists. And she was also a member of the Testing the Limits Video Collective, where she collaborated on numerous videos uh, documenting uh, the HIV AIDS crisis. Currently, she's in production on a film called Esther Newton Made Me Gay, a bio doc about the pioneering butch anthropologist and queer scholar. She's also a professor of communication and film at Long Island University in Brook Brookville, New York. She's joining Out FM via Zoom. Welcome, Jean. Hi there, John. Hi. Um, the film combines moments of great courage on Larry's part with a exploration of his his weaknesses. And um, I'm just wondering if you could just recount this section of the film where uh, Jim Igo begins the explanation of uh, there was a uh, this widespread concurrence that uh, power had to be built because the gay community and all the communities affected by AIDS were uh, uh, just being ignored by the establishment. So could you describe a little bit of that? Well, let me, I, I guess we'll talk about the, the situation itself at the time was uh, that um, Larry was very invested after being ousted from gay men's health crisis, an organization that, you know, he was really a catalyst behind. He was ousted from that, so he was looking for a more powerful political arm that that could pressure uh, the government and agencies to have a quicker response. So, you know, that's what Jim was uh, talking about in that segment. And that's what Larry always hoped for ACT UP was to be the, the kind of bad cop, you know, that ACT UP would get out there and, and make a ruckus. And that would help us develop the kind of power that we needed. Great. Well, can you tell us a little bit, you know, about, I mean, the, the film is great about showing these great moments that, you know, Larry had, uh, where he showed courage and, and conviction and passion. 
and, and also his weaknesses. And I'm just wondering how well did you know Larry Kramer in the early days of ACT UP? Uh, how far back did you go? Or can you tell us a little bit about that? What made you want to make the film? Well, I had first run into Larry at Gaiman's Health Crisis in the mid-1980s. And at that time, Larry was already persona non grata. You know, he was very bitter about the um, organization. And that's, you know, but well documented in the normal heart, uh, the whole story of that. So uh, my first uh, encounter with Larry was, uh, I had seen him around, but I had to interview him for the oral history project that GMHC was doing. And in the oral history project, they were, um, our mission was to interview the remaining board members and people who had founded important programs within gay men's health crisis, like the Buddy program. And every, Larry came later on in the process, but every person who came in, just had one horror story after another about Larry. Things he did, he went to the mayor's office meeting and he threw the pamphlets all over the table and you know, just countless stories of Larry's being out of control. So by the time he came in and we had to interview him, I, I didn't know what was gonna happen, but I was, I was prepared for the worst. And he sat down and proceeded to give an hour long interview that was very gracious, um, very um, complex in terms of his understanding that at times he was acting kind of outlandishly, but that's what he felt was needed. So, you know, from that time, I really uh, was fascinated by Larry. And then when I saw the way he acted or how he acted within ACT UP, it always was very interesting to me how. He, he was kind of, in a way, this father figure, in a way, that, um, you know, people looked up to. They really did look up to him. Maxine talks about that quite a bit in the film. Well, um, I wanted to go next to Eric Sawyer. And Eric, um, I think you're off mute. So uh, anyway, I, um, I Eric... Eric is a longtime ACT UP member. He's a founding member of ACT UP, and uh, he's been involved in the global struggle against um, AIDS uh, from pre-protease inhibitor days from the very beginning, and has uh, be, been a founding member of Health Gap, which is a group that has long championed the availability of generic drugs uh, to people in poor countries around the world and has n worked for UN AIDS. Um, he has a great accomplishment um, in life around fighting the disease. And he's also a person living with HIV and AIDS. And um, I just wanted to see, Eric, if you'd share with us um, what went into Larry's speech uh, that was uh, given at the center and what did Larry have in mind um, as he was going into it? And was there any organization in advance of that speech that helped form ACT UP? Sure, um, uh, Larry uh, has been a friend of mine since 1980. He was one of the very first people that I met when I moved to the city and he um, uh, you know, helped me uh, find a gay doctor when I started being symptomatic in 81 and, uh, you know, was from the very first uh, beginnings of the epidemic, the person sounding the alarm about the epidemic, writing with Larry Mass in the New York native. And so, uh, you know, he went on to help form the gay men's health crisis. And he, he always wanted um, more activism, more uh, politicized activity to, you know, try to push the government to find a cure and, and to take care of people. And so when he started GMHC, he hoped that it would not only take care of people, be a service organization, but do political stuff. And all of the political things that he was doing is what Gene was mentioning got him thrown out. So when he was uh, invited to do a speech at the LGBT Community Center in a writer series, he decided that he was going to, you know, 
call um, for the formation of a civil disobedience organization uh, to try to do protests to demand a cure for AIDS. And uh, so he, he literally picked up the phone and started calling his friends, uh, you know, not only friends like myself who were, you know, more personal friends, but who, you know, cared about HIV, had HIV. Um, uh, but he also called uh, people like Tim Sweeney at the Gay Men's Health Crisis and Vivian Shapiro at um, the on the board of uh, HRC and uh, people like Ma uh, Maxine who were involved in in the organization and alerted us to the fact that he was going to give this speech and ask us to come to the or to the uh, speech and you know literally when he was talking to me said I you know I need you there as a plant. Uh, I want you to rabble rouse when I, when I call for um, activists, uh, volunteers to stand up and help plan the, you know, a civil de disobedience uh, action. I want you to stand up and bring some, some friends with you to stand up also uh, to encourage um, many people to, to join this effort. And so I was more than happy to, to go and uh, play that role and, uh, after helping to form the first organization, I'm sorry, the first demonstration and seeing its success, I really kind of got hooked with that, uh, you know, demonstration, um, you know, you know, buzz the, you know, the 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 adrenaline that that it gave us, and uh, you know, there was lots of, I mean, now we would call it um, a viral uh, media. Uh, response to it, and it was really, you know, powerful to see uh, the media giving attention to people living with AIDS and LGBT people demanding um, uh, research and a, and a cure for AIDS. Uh, and I got hooked and really never left. Well, also joining us uh, on tonight's discussion is Maxine Wolf, a longtime radical political activist and organizer. She was a participant in the civil rights, anti-war uh, and anti-apartheid movements in the 60s and a lesbian and feminist activist um, who uh, became a, a very active leader of ACT UP in its first 10 years. In the 70s, she had been active in the Coalition for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization Abuse, the Reproductive Rights National Network, and the Coalition Against Racism, Sexism, and Heterosexism, with the great acronym of CRASH. Uh, in 1987, Maxine became one of the founders of the, both the New York and the National Act Up Women's Committees, or caucuses. Uh, in the early 90s, she co-founded the direct action group Lesbian Adventures. She's currently a member of Revolting Lesbians, a direct action group formed in response to Trump's election. Maxine has also been a longtime coordinator of the Lesbian History Archives and is a professor emerita of the Environmental Psychology PhD program at City University of New York. Welcome to Out of Fem, Maxine. Well, hello, everybody. So nice to see you. Hey, Max. Yes, indeed. Hi. So let me <laughs> just start with a very basic question for you as an overview for people from your political perspective, what do you think was the most important role that Larry played in helping both to bring to life and then sustaining and championing this mass AIDS activist movement starting in 1987? I think his major role was to be a rabble rouser, and people didn't generally love that in, in ACT UP. Uh, you know, they, they sort of had this strange relationship with Larry, which is they wanted him to yell, but they didn't want him to yell. And he always felt that he had a special place, so he felt he could interrupt anybody. So people who were the facilitators of the meeting were constantly having arguments with him about whether or not he could speak. He always felt he could speak anytime he wanted to. Um, you know, so, so he was a kind of a, the spirit of ACT UP. You know, he was the person who was always angrier than anybody else which I think was important because people were angry enough, but he wanted people to get off their asses and do something. And that was something he would always say. And one of the ways that we would always disagree when he would always use the Jew you know, description and he would always say, don't be like the Jews and not do anything. And then I would always have to say to him, Larry, Jews did something. Okay. So he always had that kind of analysis that you needed to get out there, don't talk, act 
and um, which was always interesting to me because behind the scenes he was always talking. You know? um, <laughs> and he would talk to anybody who would listen to him. You know, he would go and he would meet with anybody in the government that he could get in a room. And, um, but he, he never made that the, the be all and end all. And in a way, I think that that created the, the basic uh, situation and act of that work, which was you talk to people and you also get out on the street. So you have what I call the inside outside strategy. And you want the people on the inside to think that you can't control the people on the outside because really you can't control them. But if they think that you're gonna be the person to speak to them, then they have to understand that the people on the street are gonna push you and you're gonna to have to push them. So that strategy was something that he contributed to a great deal. Um, but I also want to say that Larry was a very complex person. You know, he, um, he was very smart. He read a huge amount. He knew people in a range of, of situations in the world, um, mostly in the theater and the arts and, uh, uh, you know, in, in that realm. But he, 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 he would go into his house and he had books everywhere. I mean, he was always reading four books at once. Um, and he was always, the, the thing that I liked, and people always wondered how he got along because he used to call me the old lefty, and, uh, <laughs> which I was in relationship to him. And I wasn't as old as he was, um, slightly younger. But um, he, you know, he was willing to admit what he didn't know, which many people do not, you know, especially in politics. A lot of people in politics sort of claim they know everything. Look at Trump. Um, and when they know nothing, you know, they know nothing and they never admit it, but Larry would always do that. And so one of the ways that we got along was he was always interested in what, you know, left theory was or whatever. And, um, the funniest experience I ever had with him was I ran into him one day in, in the village and, um, he came up to me and he said, I understand now. I understand now. And he had this book that I can't remember the author, but it was about, um, the way that, that uh, politics work when you have a grassroots movement that's out on the street. And the author, who I'm, I will remember at some point, was writing that, you know, it's the people on the street who are like the working class part of the movement, okay, who, who are the rough people, okay, who push everything. And then it's the middle class people that get invited to the table. And so he said to me, it's class, it's class. And it was like a revelation to him that there was actually a class structure that explains something about politics. But he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't act like that was bad to say that he just understood that. Do you know what I mean? He was perfectly willing to, to admit that he had been ignorant of that, despite the fact that he was well-read, you know, intelligent, well-educated individual. And I always loved that about Larry, you know, that he... He was always open to ideas. He would take ideas from anywhere. If they worked, he loved them even better. Um, well, in that vein, Maxine, let me ask you about one particular aspect of ideas that you were always in the forefront in ACT UP of putting forward. And that has to do with um, feminism and the analysis of um, male supremacy as an organized system. Um, now, ACT UP was unusual and is unusual among many social change organizations in that there's not one leader and one ideology. It really has a, a very democratic structure and leadership that's based on um, whatever is kind of the dominant uh, approach at the moment. What, what is the, who is the target? What is the issue of the moment? Um, and in the 80s, when it was formed and in the first few years, uh, when I first got involved, it, it was really a synthesis of left, feminist, anti-racist, lesbian and gay liberationist, and other kinds, and people who had no political background, um, which reflected the diversity of who, who really made it work and made it succeed in its actions. Um, but while the group was predominantly gay and bisexual men, many of them, of course, facing either their own life-threatening health crisis or that of a lover or a friend, um, what's too often overlooked, but 
not by any of the guests on this show, is that lesbians were an essential and numerically significant part of the group. So Maxine, can you talk about your, your experience in the women's health movement and in the lesbian movement uh, more broadly, how that um, had an impact on Larry's understanding of political issues of AIDS that were not just about gay men's uh, experience of AIDS, and then how, of course, you subsequently went on to have a tremendous influence, you and your colleague, lesbians in the group, on the politics and understanding of the men overall in the group. Yeah, I think that, um, so when I first came into ACT UP, I uh, actually ran in, I was not at the, one of the first meetings, I actually went to my first meeting in June, right after Gay Pride, actually the first meeting after the Gay Pride March. And I was at the Gay Pride March and I had been doing various things about, about AIDS, just trying to find a home. And I, I was looking for direct action kind of place because that's the way I define myself. And uh, I saw the ACT UP, they had a concentration camp float and I went over to, to a woman there and I said, are there women in this group? And she said, oh yeah. Okay, so that Monday I show up in the community center and there's like 200 men and four visible women. Okay, and I went like, really? <laughs> okay, but you know, I have always had this philosophy that I cannot be in a group and not get to know people. Like I can't, I can't work politically and personally. I have to ha feel that I'm in a community of, peop of like-minded people. Um, and so one of the things that I did in ACT UP was to start this thing called the Dyke Dinner. Um, I still do it to this day, um, the two days before the Gay Pride March. Um, 14 women come and have dinner in my garden. Uh, and, um, and that made, you know, and, and so then I wanna say that one of the things that we all spoke about, because almost every woman, by, that, by the time we had the first night dinner, there were, I think, six women there or seven women there. And everyone, every single woman had had some political experience, which is why we ended up being many of the leaders of ACT UP, because we had the political experience. There were a lot of men there who had never done anything politically. And in fact, there were very few people that I recognized in a room full, of, you know, as a person who had been active politically in New York for so many years, I walked into that room and I hardly knew anybody. I think the only person I knew was Marty Robinson. Um, okay. And I, I didn't, you know, Larry was irrelevant to me. I mean, I never read faggots. I didn't hang out in that group of people at all. And in fact, um, one of the things that happened with Larry was that uh, he said something in one, one of the first meetings that I was in and I, I basically sat there for a month not saying anything trying to figure out what the group was about and he said something and I disagreed with, I stood up and disagreed with him and you would have thought I shot him. Everyone in the room went <gasps> like that, you know, <laughs> somebody is challenging Larry Kramer, um, which I think is why we always became great friends. But anyway, the women just immediately, we had all worked in some part of the women's movement, whether it was the younger women working in college or someone like me who had done reproductive rights and women's health or Marion Bansoff who had done a lot of stuff on abortion rights and women's health. And we knew things about the system. I mean, we knew how the FDA worked. We knew about how they produced things that killed, killed women, you know. Uh, uh, so we, we, we didn't have a, um, a sort of, we had a very sophisticated view of that. And the other thing was that several of us had already done civil disobedience. So that was nothing new to us. So we became the people who trained the marshals, who you know, taught civil disobedience, who did the logistics of actions, figuring out how to get past the cops. Um, we, we, we did the first action and act up that didn't have a permit, which was the demonstration at Cosmopolitan Magazine for the article they wrote saying that women, heterosexual women could could have sexual intercourse with someone who had HIV and not have any protection and, and, and never get sick. And we did a, a huge demonstration about that. Um, but we, that was the first demonstration in ACT UP where, where we did not get a permit. And I remember Marty Robinson was apoplectic. He, he wanted us to, to meet with the cops and talk to the cops. And we just said, we don't talk to the cops, you know. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and that sort of became the premise of ACT UP was we, and after that, we never asked for a permit. 
you know, we did actions without ever asking for a permit. So, um, but that, that we did teach-ins about women in HIV because many of the gay men had no idea even how the, I remember Larry who said that was the first time that he had seen the anatomy of a woman, you know, because we did this diagram. That's what I mean about the fact that he was willing to say stuff like that. Um, so, you know, we, we, we basically felt that we had to teach stuff. But I do want to say one other thing is that of that original group that met, one of the first questions we discussed at our first dinner was why were we as lesbians in ACT UP? Because at that time, nobody was saying that women got infected. No one was saying that lesbians could, could get infected. What were we doing there? And basically, we all had different reasons for being there, but mostly none of us wanted to be the people who said, you know, started yelling out at men who did something sexist, like sexist, sex, you know, we had been through that. We, we were tired of that. We knew that wasn't the way to change anything. And so we developed the strategy, which is in a meeting when someone would get up, one of the men would get up and they would say, who's going to man the tables? Some woman in the room would very quietly say, staff. And then in short order, everybody was saying, who's going to staff the table? You know, we felt that we were not there to do the sexism number. And that didn't mean that we didn't want to work about women's issues. We did work about women's issues. We worked on every committee in ACTA, not just the women's committee. Um, but we didn't go in with that kind of an attitude. We went in with the attitude that we were dealing with HIV and we were doing it in the broadest sense possible. And we were not going to browbeat men because. As I used to say, you know, you have the people who are absolute misogynists, they're never going to change. Then you have the men who are total feminists, and they're going to back you. But the majority of the men in that room were badly trained, <laughs> okay? And that, that was the point, was that they didn't, they didn't mean to be badly trained, but from the time they were young, this society teaches young men a certain way of being. And that you know, they, they didn't do that intentionally. So why scream at them? You know, if you don't scream at them and you just say what you think should be happening. And we had great success. Men always came to our actions. It was not a thing where it was all women who came. Yeah, so one of the things that um, I wanted to also ask about is for much of his life, uh, Larry made harsh criticisms of the gay community. And in, in, in this began in the pre-70s AIDS period when the novel titled Faggots uh, uh, attacked what he saw as widespread emphasis by gay men on free-spirited sexuality rather than love relationships. And then later as AIDS became an epidemic, he accused the com gay community of insufficient anger and activism. Uh, while also denouncing the utter silence of much of straight society and the terrible indifference of political and corporate establishments. 